Hello and welcome to How to Push a Boulder Up a Hill. Just kidding, there'll be no point in learning how to do that. In the words of Albert Camus, there is but only one serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. All the rest, whether or not the world has three dimensions, whether the mind has nine or twelve categories, come afterwards. These are games. One must first answer. Our inquiry question for this episode is something like, what is the meaning of life and how do we live a life without meaning? Born in 1913 in Algeria, Albert Camus lived his life in Paris and died tragically in a car accident in 1960. Albert Camus is considered the father of absurdism. According to absurdism, the efforts of humanity to find inherent meaning will ultimately fail. In part one, we're going to be looking at the life of Albert Camus. In part two, we're looking at the absurd. In part three, we're looking at responding to the absurd. And in part four, we're engaging in further analysis and discussion. And we have a special guest joining us to deliberate the sociological problems with suicide as well. We're dealing with some very serious issues in today's episode which relate to suicide. If you're affected or influenced by anything we discussed today or have any suicidal thoughts, you should contact the Samaritans if you're in the UK and the phone number for that is 116123. You can also contact PIRAS which is 0800 068 4141. You can also email both of these services as well as phoning them and you can also text the Samaritans number. Also you can speak to your GP. Or if you're in an emergency situation, please contact your emergency services. Obviously, that's 999 in the UK. With all that said, we're going to enjoy the episode and we're going to engage in some really good philosophical discussion on Albert Camus, one of the most romanticised and influential philosophers to have lived. Hello and welcome to episode 18 of the Pan Psycast on Albert Camus. I am Jack Symes and I'm joined by the absurd Mr. Andrew Horton. Good day. And the man who has committed philosophical suicide, Mr. Oliver Marley. Hello. How are you both doing? You both well? I am embracing the absurdity of life right now, Jack. Boing, boing, zing, zing there. I'm not sure what that was. Should we uh, <laughs> jump in straight away with thoughts about Camus? What do we think about Camus going into this episode? I, uh, well, I like Camus in that he, he writes in lots of different styles and, and promotes all of his ideas largely through novels and, and through play writing and, and the such. So just like Sartre, he, he doesn't view philosophy entirely as, as this purely academic, uh, subject. It's something that you live and also present in that different type of format. Yeah, just like Andy said, I think he's quite accessible for the modern reader. So obviously his books are a bit, well, obviously were written, written not that as long ago as some of the other texts we've looked at, roughly kind of in the 1940s uh, and 50s. Uh, and yeah, and obviously just like Sartre, he kind of communicates his ideas through, through novels and through other means apart from the philosophical essay. And I think that actually a lot of his ideas are very contemporary. Um, and very raise some extremely interesting questions, if not the most interesting question. So hopefully we're going to debate that today. Yeah, superb. He thought it was the most interesting, the most serious problem, which we said in the introduction, is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. I've got great respect for Camus. I think this is a massively important topic and perhaps is the most fundamental question to decide, first of all, what is the meaning of life? Does it have purpose? We're going to be looking at his philosophy in answer to that question this episode. Part 1. Life. Our inquiry question, what in the life was Camus' life like? Okay, so to start off, we're going to have a look at the life of Camus. Um, so we'll start off with when he was born. Jack, when was he born? He's born in 1913 in Algeria. For our 
Listeners with a you know a lack of geographical knowledge, wh- where is Algeria located? North Africa. Yeah, so we're looking at North Africa. Uh, interesting as well, Algeria was a French colony, um, so obviously a lot of people in Algeria speak French. Um, I think it's the second most spoken language there, if not the first. Um, don't quote me on that one. Um, so yeah, so obviously... Camus was born in Algeria. He was a, a white person, French by descent, but obviously born in this colony. Camus was quite a working class person. Um, if we look kind of look at his parentage, so his uh, his mother was a cleaner. So we're not looking at someone like Sartre who's come from a quite a bourgeois background. He's definitely kind of more of a working class um, person in terms of his uh, philosophy. Um, his father died of war wounds in 1914. So obviously when Camus was one, which is one of the parallels with Sartre already that in his first year of life, his, uh, his father passed away. Interestingly, so he was a part of uh, his university Algerian football team, which we'll, we'll mention in a second. But he was in France for when everyone was leaving France between 1940 and 1944 during the Nazi occupation of Paris. He went to Paris when everyone else was leaving and because he was three months unemployed, we think, at the time. He was looking for a new start and he really wanted to run far with his um, his philosophies. I think he wrote his dissertation on Neoplatonism, which is the, so you see the language coming out in some of his essays, which seems quite Neoplatonic. We'll do perhaps future episodes on Neoplatonism in the future. Picking up on the football point, Jack, did you know that Camus was once asked by his friend Charles Ponquet which he preferred, football or the theatre? Now, Jack, what do you think Camus is going to say in response to this? Football or theatre? Football or theatre? I think he said football without hesitation. He did say exactly football <laughs> without hesitation. It's almost so, as if you're reading the same notes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we've got an individual here who's obviously interested in philosophy, but just like Sartre, we don't want to objectify him in this manner. Um, he had many other factors that were important to him as well. You know, football, obviously, a very important part of his life as well as his philosophy. Yeah, he was, again, sympathetic to the Marxist ideology, and he was a member of the Communist Party from an early age. And he was asked in the 1950s, about his football and he he said after many years during which i saw many things what i know most surely about morality and the duty of man i owe to sport and learnt it through the rua which is the university league that he was playing in i think he's often romanticized as a brilliant goalkeeper (laughs) i think he was quite as good as he had tuberculosis didn't he so i'm not sure how how long he could have kept up a career in football if you're a goalkeeper you don't it doesn't matter too much just sort of (laughs) stand there i mean it's fine um not just obviously uh you know a sportsman but he won the nobel prize for literature in 1957 um award that he accepted unlike sartre who obviously declined it um you know camus who was I've mentioned Sartre a couple of times, but they were close friends as well. So obviously both existentialists, both part of this French existential movement. Yeah. Um, well, I guess they're Jack somewhat rolling his eyes at labeling Camus an ex- existentialist. I think he has certain, uh, existentialist, uh, philosophical ideas, but, uh, to label Camus as a uh, existentialist is often considered uh, to be wrong. Which yeah, I mean, the, however, uh, in that the, he he said himself that he was not an existentialist. Yeah, so in an interview in Les Nouveaux Literaires in uh, 1945, Camus said point blank, "I am not an existentialist." He went to say, "Sartre and I are always surprised to see our names linked." We have even thought of publishing a short statement in which the undersigned declare that they have nothing in common with each other and refuse to be held responsible for the debts they might respectively incur. It's a joke, actually. Sartre and I publish our books without exception before we had ever met. When we did get to know each other, it was to realise how much we differed. Sartre is an existentialist. On the only book of ideas that I have published, The Myth of Syphysis, was directed against the so-called existentialist philosophers. He compares Sartre's idea to philosophical suicide, a concept we're going to be dealing with in the next part. Kierkegaard and Sartre's answers to the absurd are not the answers which Camus thinks are the right answers. They're a form of response to it and a solution to the absurd, but they don't answer the question. It's not a defensible position to hold. So what would we call him instead if he's not an existentialist? What would he like to be labelled as? An absurdist. Well, I, I'm not even sure. I doubt he would have labelled himself. Did he label himself that? Or is that just a, a label now given to I him? I think he labelled it himself, but I, let's call him an absurdist. absurdist That's definitely yeah. the label we should be giving yeah. him. Yeah. Um, just, I guess, uh, before we get ma- on to his major philosophical thoughts, um, Jack, you mentioned the Communist Party. And yeah, it's, it's interesting. Part, a big part of his life, his early life, was to be a you know, political activist in that sense. And he did back communism early on in his life and, uh, joined the, rev- uh, the, sorry, the resistance in Paris against the uh, occupation of the Nazis. And it's thought that Jean-Paul Sartre 
felt almost like that that's that's what Sartre kind of wanted to be and later became much more of a political writer um but i think we mentioned it in the Sartre episode that at the time Sartre was coming more political uh Camus actually took a step back as far as overtly uh politicizing his writing um and ultimately did not decided not to back communism as the answer to the problems being faced and that Sartre wanted any like he wanted marxism to prevail and if that meant backing the the soviet union then that's what it meant even at the hands of uh people being killed uh left right and center whereas Camus took a much more um kind of ethical stance against the 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 soviets yeah and Camus and Sartre's friendship kind of fell apart because of this because of their ideological difference towards marxism Sartre fully kind of embracing it and trying to kind of repackage it and mix it with existentialism and obviously Camus completely rejecting it completely rejecting the kind of communist workings of the USSR. In 1934, Camus married Simone High, but the marriage ended because of infidelities on both sides. He later married Francine Four, a pianist and mathematician, and he loved her quite passionately, and he had twins, Catherine and Jean, in 1945. Catherine, I know, is still alive today. As a 100-year anniversary in 2013, they interviewed her some philosophy magazines, and they spoke to Catherine about her father's thoughts. I haven't got the exact quote here, but his daughter says something along the lines of Catherine says in this interview that despite Albert's many affairs, him and his wife always loved each other very deeply. It's kind of a theme here, isn't there? Because um, Camus was quite critical of the institution of marriage and kind of dismissed it as being quite unnatural. I mean, this kind of raises a question. We've looked at three philosophers now in a row who have been quite had some difficulties with this this idea of marriage. We've looked at Kierkegaard, we've looked at Sartre, and now Camus. Um, three people who really seem to kind of struggle with this idea of commitment and marriage. What do you think about that, Andy? I think it just speaks to the fact that they all deeply want freedom and they want to be able to make choices uh, that they can do without having to consult with somebody else or without having to worry about, uh, you know, you know, taking responsibility for another person and maybe kids as well as all of the other things that go along with a marriage. Um, so it's not really a surprise if you're leaning towards a more existential life view that being tied down is not easy or not what you really want. In 1960, at the age of 46, Camus tragically died in a car accident. Famously in his coat pocket was an unused train ticket, so he was planned to travel by train with his wife and children, but at the last minute he accepted his publisher's proposal to travel with him instead. There was a, actually a, a conspiracy that the Soviet Union had planned his assassination, but Camus' biographers chucked this out the window as incredible. But because of Camus' opposition to the USSR, and if you've heard our Sartre episode, obviously Sartre was quite in favour of uh, Russian ideology taking over France, whereas Camus saw the Russians and the USSR as the opposite. He wanted some kind of American ideology I was just going to say, like, but don't try and paint Camus as someone who's kind of very pro-American, even though he was quite anti-Russia uh, in this case. So um, he was very critical of the atomic bomb being dropped on Japan um, soon, very soon after, especially after Japan surrendered in 1945. Um, he was actually one of the first people who was actually published in France to be vocally anti um, the atomic bomb being dropped um, on Japan, um, which at the time would have been quite a uh, um, very... Um, risky thing to publish with you know people literally around you celebrating the end of this five year long conflict while well, you are kind of <laughs> well Camus was sat there you know being quite critical of the fact that you know that atomic bomb was dropped Sartre wanted to always be more on the ground like Camus was Camus was a working class hero in a sense he was in the communist party from an early age and he was actually a part of the combat the French newspaper that was against the Nazi regime during the time of the occupation in 1941 Camus eventually became to be the editor of this, and as we were saying, Sartre becomes more involved in the political resistance after the death of Camus. And even then, after Camus' death, although they fell out, he writes a really flattering obituary of Camus' work and life, which we'll be quoting from later. Actually, I'll just quote quickly from his obituary here. He and I had a quarrel. A quarrel doesn't matter. Even if those who quarrel never see each other again, just another way of living together without losing sight of one another in the narrow little world that is allotted to us. It didn't keep me from thinking of him, from feeling that his eyes were on the book or newspaper I was reading and wondering, what does he think of it? What does he think of it at this moment? So there's Sartre. Obviously, he's massively influential in Sartre's work and Devore's work. Camus, hugely influential in the intellectual movement of 
pre and post Nazi occupied Paris. Yeah, um, obviously we've talked a little bit about obviously his life and his relationship with Sartre. Um, but obviously his philosophy, um, you know, the idea of the absurd is quite different. Also very, um, just like Sartre, again, another parallel, even though his philosophy was different, he was someone that kind of projected this idea through not just through philosophical writing, but through novels as well. So we kind of listed a few novels of his at the start of the episode. They're actually quite short, generally. They're not big, lengthy tomes. The plague's really long. I haven't finished it yet. Uh, the plague's very, long, very long. But the outside is quite short. And The Fool's very short. So we recommend that you read them. They're quite accessible. Um, if you're if you're interested in this philosophy of Camus, this idea of the absurd, um, it is definitely, um, again, just like Sartre, reflected in his writings. And again, in quite an accessible manner. And you're quite right to call him an existentialist because he's starting again from the subjective truth of individuals and you should live out your philosophy in the Kierkegaardian sense. He shouldn't just make, you know, decide on what the meaning of life is or decide that we have radical freedom and then just ignore it and live in bad faith in Sartre's terms. We should recognize these things and live them. And that's probably why these people, the existentialists weren't married and they weren't engaged in the typical what would be considered normal living at yeah. the time. They were quite anti-establishment, quite anti-status quo, whether it's their view towards traditional authority or towards the institutions of marriage or the church. Um, yeah, the existentialist movement, not necessarily just all existentialists, yeah, could be seen as like a reaction against that. As the most read philosophical writer of the 20th century, Camus' life is incredibly interesting and certainly worth looking up more detail about it online and further links can be found on the website. Part two, the absurd. Our inquiry question, what is the absurd? I will take that question and answer it straight away, Jack. Uh, the absurd, it's, we'll start actually with Kierkegaard. He's one of the first people to use it in the sense that we're, we're going to kind of continue to use it. And it comes up in Fear and Trembling, which we discussed a few episodes back. And for Kierkegaard, the, the absurd is about, uh, embracing something that is contradictory to reason and that if it goes if something goes entirely against reason then you can call it absurd usually when you're hearing the word absurd in ca like casual conversation ollie how how is one to use the word absurd so yeah general conversation the word absurd just means something that's just ridiculous normally so like i don't know you could say oh i was driving down the motorway yesterday and i saw a clown driving a car People that's will be like, absurd. that's absurd, that's ridiculous. It's kind of just like another word for ridiculous or slightly silly. Um, but that's slightly different to the way we're going to use the absurd today. We're going to use the word, or Camus, sorry, uses the word absurd in its truest kind of sense of the, the meaning of the yeah. word. And the, so if, if one interpretation is like contradictory to reason, um, I think Camus takes it a little bit further than that because what it's about is um it would be wrong to say the world is absurd or that human beings are absurd what Camus talks about ab absurdity is the relationship that human beings have with the world because throughout most of human history we are constantly striving to find meaning and for the most part of it it will be that god creates some sort of meaning for us and that our relationship with the divine and this eternal life uh creates meaning for us and for camus uh he's going to say that this there isn't that meaning there present and so what ends up happening is is you have human beings attempting to find meaning in a world that can't offer it and it's the friction between those two things that camus talks about when he talks about the absurd yeah, so if we're going to kind of break it down into kind of basic, simple terms, we could say that the absurd is the situation in which human beings demand that their lives should have significance in an indifferent universe, which is itself totally without meaning or purpose. So the absurd thing isn't that the universe doesn't care. The absurd thing in this case for Camus is that the universe doesn't care, but we really want it to care. That's the absurd thing, that we're looking at the, the universe. The universe is totally indifferent to us. And we're demanding that it give us some kind of purpose or some form of justification. Yeah. And you, outside of a religious sense, people use this kind of terminology quite a bit when you like, for instance, if you take a, a natural disaster, people will say, like, how, uh, no, nature is so cruel. And it's like, well, nature's not cruel. Nature's indifferent. Like the, a tsunami that hits uh, a town and uh, thousands of people die is not cruel. It's just 
nature. Like, yeah, it's just yeah. what happened. This board is quite closely with nihilism, doesn't it? What you were just saying, Ollie, the fact that uh, life doesn't seem to have meaning. But a nihilist would say life doesn't have meaning. I think Camus is being a little bit more philosophically economical here by saying we can't find that there is meaning. So the absurd is essentially we as humans want to see that the world has meaning. We look for meaning in the world, right? Like Andy was saying, we want to feel like we've got some kind of purpose, some end, some telos. But mean life doesn't seem to have meaning or we have an inability to find it so on the one hand we want meaning on the other hand life doesn't seem to give us or present to us an inherent meaning so that's the absurd we want meaning but we can't find it now Camus not against the idea that life might have meaning but we're not going to find it right give me some examples what might someone say what's the meaning of life give me some stereotypical happiness street, happiness love love the, the truth. truth religion religion Right, God. God. Um, money. Free range tea. <laughs> right, <laughs> conquering the world. People think these are the meanings in life. So let's take happiness. You're a utilitarian. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pleasure. You're a pleasure yeah. seeker. Pleasure is the happiness which we all. Happiness is what we should strive for, and that's what gives our life meaning. And this is something which a lot of people, prima facie, on face value, they're going to say, right. Camus wrong there. My life has meaning because the meaning of my life is to be happy. Well, Camus says. Show me, prove it, show that's true. You know, show me that happiness is the purpose of life. And then, you know, you realize we're adopting a healthy bit of skepticism that they can't prove beyond all reasonable doubt that someone, that, that the purpose of someone's life is happiness. Ultimately, because of the mass unknown and the total uncertainty of proving that life has meaning, we should keep our heads screwed on and recognize that life is absurd. Life doesn't present inherent meaning to us even a scientist for example who might say that the purpose of life is to survive and reproduce for example again that kind of falls short of is that the ultimate purpose if people still feel like well a lot of people might argue that that isn't enough for them um in their objective purpose and it's a it's actually quite a fun game you can play like just talk to the people you know ask as many people as possible what do you think the meaning of life is you will get so many different responses and probably quite a lot of i have no idea but i kind of still try and make do the rest of what i've got yeah and just to go uh, on that point of science is that no matter how many scientific discoveries that we make and how much it can benefit our lives and so forth this still doesn't create any extra meaning to us uh, and the, that problem will always be there uh, science is good for discovery but perhaps not always self-discovery Camus thinks if you think about it long enough you'll realize that we can't reach a conclusion to what the meaning of life is life is absurd because we want meaning and we can't reach it this rings true to me this seems legitimate it seems like he's adopting the right amount of skepticism and he's really being rational in this it seems like people's attempts to self-help guides pe preachers on the street that throw pamphlets in your face you know got the questions we've got the answers these kind of people it doesn't seem like they're have they really got the answers Camus says have you okay I'd love Camus to meet some of these people and see the dialogue between them Camus is one of these people which he's actually got a TV interview you can look up on YouTube or link to it on the website it's amazing to see one of the greatest philosophers and look them in the eye as they're speaking about these ideas but wait a minute Jack so if Camus is saying that there is no meaning to life, is that is that pretty much what the, he's saying? He's saying that we can't find beyond reasonable doubt what the meaning of life is. He's saying that we don't know what the meaning of life is. Okay, so we don't know what the meaning of life is. Well, that raises a very important question, doesn't it, Jack? Go on. What's the point? The myth of Sisyphus, what's this? The Myth of Sisyphus is the book written by Albert Camus, which is one of his actual philosophical treaties, uh, and it's the, the really the authority on what he means about the absurd. And it was it was written with the outsider uh, and was uh, intended to be released uh, at the same time. Unfortunately, I think due to sort of publication issues, he couldn't release them at once. But in that sense, they could be treated on the on the same level as the, what themes they're kind of proposing and the whole point of the myth of sisyphus uh is that it declares what we've already said which is this idea of is uh, the only true philosophical question is whether or not one should commit suicide and he presents this by using uh an ancient greek myth which is about sisyphus roll 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 a stone up and down a hill 
Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Hey! <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Myth Corner with Andrew Horton. Today we'll be looking at the myth of Sisyphus, and this myth is is quite a good one, and it's a very popular one. It actually gets referenced quite a lot in pop culture, and, and you blatantly have seen the picture of somebody pushing a giant boulder up a hill, and if you've ever wondered, what on earth is that about? Well, now you're about to know. So, Sisyphus... I uh, remember this is an ancient Greek myth, and he, Sisyphus was a king who managed to obtain secrets about the gods and was, was then viewed uh, by Zeus as being, uh, well, a potential enemy, and he is condemned to death uh, for the actions that he's taken against the gods. And so Hades, the uh, god of the underworld, comes and is going to take Sisyphus away and what Sisyphus manages to do is he tricks Hades and actually locks him uh, away and what that means is, is uh, if you've ever watched anything actually Family Guy is an example where they do this where death is death is trapped or, or death is basically off duty and that nobody can die and uh, so that's that's part of the story is that apparently like somebody gets run over by a horse and, and like brushes themselves off somebody like comes <laughs> goes out to war and uh, sort of gets stabbed or shot by arrows and whatnot and doesn't die and uh this obviously creates problems and the gods realize what sisyphus has actually done and what ends up happening is is that zeus condemns him rather to death uh because this is why it's quite a nice little link into this obviously sisyphus values his life so much he traps death away so rather than condemning him to death uh zeus kind of twists this around and almost says look you have life but your life is going to be this. And what he tells him is, is that he has to push a boulder up this very steep hill, which is obviously quite a, a tedious and difficult task to do. Um, but the catch is, is that every time Sisyphus pushes the boulder all the way up to the top of the hill, it rolls right back down to the bottom. And Sisyphus must then walk right down back to the bottom to the boulder and do it again and do it again and do it again for infinity. And the Zeus perhaps sees this as the worst possible fate for him in that he gets life but his life becomes tedious and, and meaningless great summary there andy okay jack so how is the how is this myth connected to the idea of the absurd so at some stage Camus thinks we'll all sit down and think you know what's the purpose of life and you'll realize that you're very much like syphysis here's a quote from the myth of syphysis page five by albert Camus. It happens that the stage sets collapse. Rising, streetcar, four hours in the office or the factory. Meal, streetcar, four hours of work. Meal, sleep, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday according to the same rhythm. This path is easily followed most of the time. But one day the wire rises and everything begins and the weariness tinged with amazement. Begins. This is important. Weariness comes at the end of the acts of the mechanical life, but at the same time it inaugurates the impulse of consciousness. It awakens consciousness and provokes what follows. What follows is the gradual return into the chain or if it is the definitive awakening. At the end of the awakening comes in the time, the consequence, suicide or recovery. In itself, weariness has something sickening about it. What Camus is saying there is that if you're living, you know, this aesthetic life, as Kierkegaard would say, if you're living in bad faith, as Sartre would say, if you're just living the mechanical life and you're going to the nine till five and you don't think about what your purpose is in life, then the, the fabric gets torn for Camus and you can't help but realize that life is absurd. Just as Syphysis is pushing the stone up and down the hill, you are Syphysis, humankind is Syphysis. We're condemned to a life which is purposeless to in until we meet our graves so here's the question for Camus if life is like Sisyphus pushing the stone up and down 9 till 5, work 4 hours, sleep 4 hours, the mechanical life should we just end our lives should we just commit suicide yeah, this is the important question that comes up. And obviously, I mean, <laughs> this, like, like we said at the start of the episode, this isn't going to be the, the cheeriest episode of the Pan Sidecast ever. But it is a very important question. You know, the majority of people do live this very structured life. And this question, I, I think that Camus right. I think it will pop up for the majority of people, you know, even sometimes the very young, you know, what is the point of life? And kind of is, is this all there is to life? Is there no kind of inherent meaning? I, I think when we're younger, we're kind of, we're, we're taught the, we're introduced to the world in a very specific way of very absolute things and we're taught that you know you should be doing this you should encourage to follow this kind of line of behavior but as you kind of grow up and as you mature 
um, you realize that, you know, a lot of those systems aren't necessarily true. For example, I don't know if you guys remember when you realized that Santa Claus wasn't real, um, you know, and, you know, you kind of realize to a certain extent that there is no objective meaning. You know, your parents don't hold that. Certain authorities may claim to hold it, but a lot of people would argue that they do not. Um, so, yeah, so, so what is the meaning, if there's any meaning at all? You know, Camus kind of saying that there isn't an objective, well, that, you know, if, there, if, mean, if that meaning does exist, that we can't discover it. Yeah, and it, it raises the interesting point of that suicide would seem like a perfectly reasonable option as well. It's not, it's not that it's like, oh, somebody might find themselves questioning and, and might entertain it. It's, it's saying that if there is literally no point to anything at all, that to commit suicide would make no difference. It would, it would just be another choice that you could make and that it, in the grand scheme of things, would, would not matter. And Camus takes, uh, the position to say that actually you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't just, uh, kind of, uh, you shouldn't just uh, accept that, uh, that's the easy option out for you, uh, and that there is something to be embraced in the absurd. So he wants to know what we should do because life is absurd. And suicide, he does recognize that answers the question, that answers, that's the solution. Mm -hmm. He doesn't think it's the right solution uh, to the philosophical problem. And neither is this idea of philosophical suicide, which we'll get onto in a moment. I just want to give another long quote here, just because it touches in, in Camus' way of writing, and especially in this essay, is, is phenomenal. Suicide has never been dealt with except as a social phenomenon. On the contrary, we are concerned here at the outset with the relationship between individual thought and suicide. An act like this is prepared within the silence of the heart, as it is a great work of art. The man himself is ignorant of it. One evening he pulls the trigger or jumps. Of an apartment building manager who had killed himself, I was told that he had lost his daughter five years before and that he changed greatly since and that experience had undermined him. A more exact word cannot be imagined. Beginning to think is beginning to be undermined. Society has but little connection with such beginnings. The worm is in man's heart. This is where it must be sought. One must follow and understand this fatal game that leads from lucidity in the face of existence to flight from light. There are many causes for suicide and generally the most obvious ones were not the most powerful. Rarely is suicide committed through reflection. What sets off the crisis is almost inverifiable. Newspapers often speak of personal sorrows or of incurable illness. These explanations are plausible, but one would have to know whether a friend or the desperate man had not that very day addressed himself indifferently. He is the guilty one, for that is enough to precipitate all the rancers and all the boredom still in suspension. There's so many themes in there. That last one's really poignant. You know, that idea that that person that phones you one day and you, you're too busy, you're too busy doing a podcast or at work and you set aside and you put your, your life before that person reaching out for you. You know, that you could really make a difference there if you answered the call. We've got to be there for each other. And there's something, although he says in that first sentence, I said, suicide has never been dealt with except in a social phenomenon. And he goes on to explain the social phenomenon of su suicide for me. This is something we'll be looking at part four in more depth. But that idea that the worm is in the man's heart and that he's often ignorant of it. If we think about it enough, can we think? So if we think about life and purpose, we'll realize we can't reach life and purpose. And then we have three options. We can end our lives. We can commit philosophical suicide. Or we can... Well, he does think... That it, we shouldn't use commit suicide. We should say, um, cause it hasn't been a crime since 1961 in the UK, I think. We should say end our own life. It's not, it's not political correctness that. It's that it just, it demonizes something which is, you know, highly controversial and makes it seem like it's a crime. But a lot of people think we have a right to death. Yeah. Um, Camus I mean, certainly person that thinks we do have a right to death. Yeah. Cause we can connect this to our euthanasia episode of slightly that we've done a few weeks ago i think culturally suicide has always been seen in extremely negative terms understandably you know in terms of someone taking their own life um all major world religions think it is a sin and you can be you know punished in the afterlife for it just kind of in society suicide you know is is a problem i mean it's the the biggest killer of young men between the ages of 18 and 30 um uh, countries like japan have really really high suicide rates um and yeah, you know, it is a, it is a problem. And Camus kind of approaching it, not just like he said in that quote, he's not just, it's often been understood as just cultural, but he's kind of saying, well, maybe there's something a bit more to this. Maybe our kind of understanding of it shouldn't be necessarily negative or something that's a crime or something that should be punished. But maybe there is kind of like a philosophical justification almost for 
taking your own life to a certain extent you know this this em- embracing the absurd that he's he's effectively arguing you know is it is it worse to live a life that you know is completely meaningless and will never have you'll never understand the meaning of or or to take your own life it's a it's a really interesting question i'm quite surprised it took until the 20th century for someone to kind of understand it in that way it's quite yeah. interesting i think the reasoning behind that is because everyone always says this when we're doing the show as well why are you just doing christian philosophy why are you doing philosophy of religion well we were doing the philosophy of religion topic but everyone in european society between you know jesus historically and you know perhaps the 50 years ago yeah, yeah like this is yeah, this really recently the death of God. A lot of people thought God was dead, that they no longer had meaning. And once you take away that, what they thought was the intrinsic meaning in life, which was teleology and that God is there at the end of it, once you took that away, what's the question? That you should, does, in Camus' own words, does the absurd dictate death for these people? People they thought that had meaning in life, that committed what Camus is calling philosophical suicide, which we're going to touch on right now. Once you've lost what you thought was meaning, should we kill ourselves? Or, if you recognise life has meaning before you've lost what was your artificial meaning, should you kill yourself? Well, and one of the options that most people take, according to Camus, is to to do philosophical suicide. So, obviously, not most people go to the length and say, right, well, life has no meaning, so therefore uh, I'm prepared to take my own life. They will say... I will find any way in which to put meaning into my life, regardless of how true that meaning actually is. And so we, we listed off a bunch of things earlier about like, you know, what, what could be the meaning of life? And, and that's what most people do. They say, right, well, for me, happiness will be the meaning of life. I'm going to be a hedonist. I'm going to embrace this fully. And then that's, that's going to be the ideology, which I'm going to kind of pin uh, pin myself to got to pick one so that's what i'm going to go with but to do that is and to embrace it fully would be philosophical suicide because you're not being true to yourself and not accepting that the absurdity of this relationship with human beings on the earth just says that no i'm sorry there is no meaning uh, to it and that your attempt to escape that is not being authentic question jack would Camus say that the existentialists are performing philosophical suicide? A hundred percent, yeah. I say Sartre, this is why in that quote I gave earlier, he's so surprised to see his name next to Sartre's because he's committing philosophical suicide. For Sartre, if you decide, if you will it yourself and it's free and it's a free choice, then you, you know, you're living, you're responding to the absurd. Kierkegaard, if you take a leap of faith, that's your response to the absurd. So life doesn't seem to have meaning rationally. So I must take the leap of faith for Kierkegaard, right? I should go beyond reason. These, those are the first two responses, right? Just to recap. The first choice, it, the first choice is blunt and simple, physical suicide. If we decide that life without some essential purpose or meaning is not worth living, we can simply choose to end our own lives. Camus rejects this choice as cowardly. In his own terms, it's a repudiation, and it's not a true revolt. So we'll get on to what his solution is. But he doesn't think we should just end our own lives. He doesn't think that's the solution. It takes off half of the the absurd. It takes off the fact that life is purposeless, and so we respond to that. But it doesn't really answer the question for him. You know, the answer goes unsolved. What's the... The six billion people that come after you are going to do, are we all just going to end our lives? That doesn't seem like the right solution because it doesn't answer the question. It responds to it. It doesn't answer it, I think, is the right way to interpret them. Yeah, you can look at kind of similar examples on a smaller scale to kind of illuminate that idea where perhaps you've, you know, you're in your life, you've got a particular problem that you're facing and that something perhaps not quite as serious as debating whether or not to commit suicide and that you think by running away or pretending like that problem doesn't exist uh, and perhaps leaving it alone entirely is somehow going to fix the problem. But just because you've completely ignored the problem and ran away from it your entire life doesn't mean the problem's still not there. And that's exactly what Camus is going to say. If if you do commit suicide, you, you haven't, you haven't escaped the problem. One half of the absurd is gone, but the, the rest of it's still there to, to be experienced. So the people on the streets which you walk past that I reference, people giving you pamphlets, we have the answers, Jesus is the way, take a leap of faith with us today. Here's a self-help book which tells you the meaning of life is to get money, money, money. These kind of things, that's philosophical suicide. If you attach meaning to something, it's an artificial meaning and it isn't authentic. You're, you're living 
you're living in Plato's cave. To reference our first episode, you're living in the world of illusion. Well, it's not just that. You know better as well. It's not like you've ever, never been outside the cave. It's almost like you've gone out of the cave, seen everything, gone, there's no meaning, and then gone back into the cave and gone, actually, you know what? I'm just going to pretend that this cave is the meaning. Yeah. And I'm just going to kind of do things that way. And um, just one extra thing as well is that it's interesting that a lot of people who are atheist or non-religious will look at religious people with this um, perhaps level of almost contempt where they, they will say, oh, look at all of those people fooling themselves and, and believing in a God that creates meaning. How how naive of them. Yet they do exactly the same thing for uh, in the eyes of Camus. That if you're rejecting God and then saying, well, of course I don't believe in God, that won't give me meaning but this thing that i've assigned to myself creates the meaning like satra did then that's that's also not good enough you're you're falling yourself and on the same level as you might believe a religious person to be doing so um just perhaps not in a quite as universally shared manner do you think what you said is true that like you mentioned that some people have been out the cave and they've seen it and then they go back in because it, it kind of you, know, you get that life doesn't seem to have meaning i'll go back in the cave and pretend that this podcast has meaning or that my job has meaning or my girlfriend has meaning we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna break this down we're gonna talk about one of my favorite movies we're gonna talk about the matrix i think this might be a good point to bring this up so in the matrix brief recap of the matrix it's a movie in which uh in the future robots have enslaved us all and use us as a power source and to keep us alive i think they uh put us in a virtual reality uh computer system called the matrix um to kind of Keep, use our electricity while we're kind of in this yeah it's supposed to reality. stimulate our brains yeah. and so yeah. they can use us as batteries yeah so in this uh movie there's a group of humans who are kind of escaped from the matrix and they're trying to help other people escape from it because it's not real um, and there's lots of really interesting philosophical themes in it but there's also a character called cypher who's kind of seen as a well, one of the villains of the film and he's a human who's escaped the matrix he knows the matrix isn't real he knows that he's being the, the matrix lies to you and uh, shows you a form of reality that's not true. But what he does is he actively schemes with the 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 AI or the computers that are controlling the matrix to put himself back in the matrix. So there's a very famous scene where he's kind of sat having dinner with one of the the agents and he's talking about the steak that he's eating and how he knows that the steak he's eating is false it's not true and that the matrix is telling his brain that it's really nice and really tasty and juicy and delicious and there's a bit where he literally just eats it and goes ignorance is bliss um, and he tries to get his memory wiped to put himself back inside the matrix without any knowledge that he's ever been taken out i think this is a really good example that we can use to connect to the idea of the absurd so like jack jack just said you know people going outside of the cave then yeah it's exactly the same thing he's choosing philosophical suicide in this in this film he's going I know this isn't real, and what I'm going to do is I, because I don't like reality, because I find that's, you know, that makes me feel anxious or I don't like the fact that there's no meaning, I'm going to actively go back into the cave or go back into the matrix in this case and brainwash myself and just convince myself that that's a better reality, you know, better to be a, a pig satisfied than Socrates dissatisfied. He's yeah. just, he's choosing ignorance over, over knowledge. It's really similar to the, uh, grand inquisitor example that we use with sartre as well because there is that stuff that same thing of right so jesus has presented you with the possibility of the truth would you like it it requires a lot of hard work dedication and personal responsibility how would you like this and most people will say no thanks, no, thanks. <laughs> yeah. i'll uh i'll take the lie please <laughs> with a side of happiness yeah, yeah. <laughs> to summarize our human condition is absurd humans want meaning in life but the world and the cosmos doesn't present any inherent meaning. So what does Camus think we should do? In part three, we look at Camus' response to the absurd. Ro, I never thought I would be so pleased that I am a robot. Being a human having to reconcile oneself with the absurd must be really tough. I think I would be fine anyway. I am. Bolder. Than Sisyphus after all. Get it? Bolder? As in Sisyphus and the Boulder. Yeah well whatever. Go and write a novel about it. <laughs>